Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello, today we will be discussing about tuberculosis and what we will be learning about today is we will be looking at the clinical features of tuberculosis as well as looking at the morphology of the different forms of tuberculosis. So, let us start by looking at the causative agent, what causes this deadly disease? It, as we all know, it is caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis. And this particular organism is an obligate aerobe and that is why it is able to survive in the uh, lung tissue as well as in the lymph nodes. Now, looking at the clinical features of these patients, most of these patients will present with low grade fever. So, the fever is not very high as in viral fever, it is a very low grade fever and specially these patients will complain about an evening rise of temperature. Along with that, patients will present with cough with hemoptysis. Now, what does hemoptysis mean? Hemoptysis means that the patient brings out blood in their sputum. So, that is cough with hemoptysis and is a very, very important sign for tuberculosis. Now, apart from this, some patients will present with enlarged lymph nodes. So, lymph nodes are quite big in some of these patients and they are multiple and they are matted. So, matting is another important sign of tuberculosis. So, patients present with matted cervical lymph nodes. Now, rarely some of these patients can also have abdominal masses and that is mainly because of intestinal tuberculosis, though the incidence of this uh, kind of tuberculosis has become very low in the present days. Now, let us look at the different forms of this disease. Now, this disease presents in uh, three different forms. So, you have uh, primary tuberculosis, you have secondary tuberculosis and you have miliary tuberculosis. So, let us look at each of these forms of disease and we will also look at the uh, changes, the morphologic changes that occurs in the lung in each of these diseases as well as the course of the disease. So, let us start first with primary tuberculosis. Now, primary tuberculosis occurs in patients who have not been sensitized to this disease. So, which means it occurs in previously unexposed patients and uh, also the elderly, the immunocompromised patients are prone to developing primary tuberculosis. Now, how does this disease reach the lung? Now, it is mainly inhaled. So, by a, a droplet infection, this bacilli is inhaled and from there it reaches the distal airways. So, it reaches the distal airways and it is a droplet infection. Now, where does primary tuberculosis occur? It occurs in the lower part of the upper lobe or the upper part of the lower lobe. So, that is a very important uh, area of involvement in primary tuberculosis. And another important feature is its closeness to the pleura. As we said that it affects the distal airways, the lesion is usually seen very, very close to the pleura. And the size of the lesion is not very large, it is 1 to 1.5 centimeter in size. And as I earlier said before this, uh, it is very close to the pleura and this lesion is known as the Gons focus. So, this subpleural lesion uh, which is about 1 to 1.5 centimeters in size is the lesion which is also known as the Gons focus. Now, the bacilli which is present within the uh, macrophages, within the phagocytes at the site of uh, lung damage will then drain into the regional lymph nodes and the regional lymph node for the lung are the hyla lymph nodes. 
So, a lot of patients will have enlargement of the lung lesion and involvement of the nodes. So, this combination of lesion where there is a lung lesion and along with that there is a hilar node involvement is known as a Gons complex. So, the Gons focus was the lesion in the lung and when this lesion is accompanied by enlargement of the uh, hilar lymph nodes, the combination is known as a Gons complex. So, both Gons focus as well as Gons complex is associated with primary tuberculosis, a very important sign of primary tuberculosis. So, if you look at this picture, you can see a small subpleural uh, lesion here. You can see a small subpleural lesion in this area and accompanying it is the hilar lymph node okay? and accompanying it is the hilar lymph node. So, this combination is known as the Gons complex. So, lesion in the lung parenchyma which is subpleural which is small accompanied by a large hilar lesion is known as the Gons complex. Right? So, now the question is what happens to these patients? Once they have developed primary tuberculosis, what happens to these patients? So, in the first few weeks, via the lymphatics, via the blood vessels, the bacilli can spread to different parts of the body. So, that is known as the lymphatic as well as the hematogenous spread. And where does it spread? It usually spreads to the meninges, where it is known as tuberculous meningitis. And it can also go to multiple other organs and then it is known as miliary tuberculosis and in the due course we will see what miliary tuberculosis means. It is another form of tuberculosis, but can also occur as a complication of primary tuberculosis. Now, when you look at the Gons uh, complex, which was the pulmonary lesion along with the hilar lymph node lesion. This lesion can undergo fibrosis and then beyond that it can calcify. So, these calcified lesions can be picked up by the x-rays. So, sometimes when you uh, take x-rays of patients, you will find a calcified lesion either in the lung or in the hilar lymph node region. So, it represents an old healed tuberculosis. Okay. So, now the question comes how do you actually diagnose it. You are suspecting tuberculosis and important finding is the histology in these patients. So, the hallmark of tuberculosis is the presence of a caseating granuloma. Now, you would have learnt earlier that granulomas can be seen in many different conditions and many of these granulomas are non-caseating, but in tuberculosis the lesion has to be a caseating granuloma. So, that is the hallmark of tuberculosis. Now, uh, rarely we see that in some of the immunocompromised patients like HIV patients, you do not see a classic caseating granuloma, but uh, still some components of this granuloma will be present. So, let us look at what is the classic histologic picture of a granuloma. So, the special cell that we see in a granuloma are these epithelioid histiocytes. Now, what are these epithelioid histiocytes? These are nothing but modified macrophages. Now, wh what are macrophages? Macrophages are modified monocytes. So, the monocytes which are present in your blood, they come into the region where this bacilli is present and they get converted into epithelioid histiocytes. So, these are the special types of histiocytes which are present in patients who have tuberculosis. Now, as the disease progresses, these epithelioid histiocytes, they fuse, they join together and they form these large multinucleated cells and these are known as the Langhans giant cells. Now, if you look at the Langhans giant cell, you will see that the nucleus is arranged around the periphery of these cells. So, that is the speciality about Langhans giant cells compared to other giant cells, where the nuclei are very haphazardly placed. But in a Langhans giant cell, it is arranged at the periphery and we call it as a typical horseshoe shaped arrangement. 
the horseshoe shaped arrangement. So, that is a special kind of giant cell that you see in tuberculosis. Now, accompanying these based on the amount of cytokines that are released, lot of lymphocytes are recruited into this zone, lot of lymphocytes get recruited into this zone and following which there is formation of plasma cells, there is formation of plasma cells. So, you have many, many different kinds of cells which form this granuloma. It started with the epithelioid histiocytes, they form the giant cells, lymphocytes were recruited and the plasma cells were recruited into this area. Now, as this granuloma becomes larger and larger, another important feature that we see is the central pink area, which is known as the zone of caseation necrosis. So, caseous necrosis is another very important finding, which when seen in the histology or in the biopsy of the patients, helps us to diagnose a patient as tuberculosis. So, the presence of epithelioid histiocytes, the presence of Langhans giant cells and the presence of caseous necrosis along with lymphocytes and plasma cells is highly diagnostic of a patient having tuberculosis. So, please remember that the hallmark lesion of tuberculosis at any site is a granuloma. Yes? So, whether it is primary, whether it is secondary, whether it is disseminated tuberculosis or tuberculous meningitis, you will always see granulomas in the histology of these uh, biopsies. So, with that let us move on to the second form of the disease which is known as secondary tuberculosis. Yes. Now, secondary tuberculosis unlike primary, in primary we said that the patient is, is a unsensitized patient, while in secondary tuberculosis it is seen in previously sensitized patients. So, the patient has come across this bacilli earlier. So, patients who already had primary tuberculosis can then develop secondary tuberculosis or a patient has a dormant lesion which gets reactivated. So, such patients can also develop secondary tuberculosis or it is a reinfection or it is a reinfection. Uh, so, these are the three main uh, ways in which patients can develop secondary tuberculosis. Now, in primary tuberculosis, when we looked at the morphology, when we looked at the gross, we said that the lesion was in the upper part of the lower lobe or the lower part of the upper lobe. But here in secondary tuberculosis, lesions are always in the apex of either one lung or both the lungs. Yes, so there is a difference in the site of involvement. In secondary tuberculosis, it is the apex of the lungs which is involved. And this is because of very high oxygen tension in the apices, which promotes the growth of these bacteria. Now, if you look at the initial lesion, it starts as a very small area. So, it is a very small focus of what is known as consolidation. So, a small focus of consolidation in the lung is the initial focus of infection. And from there, the lesion can become more than 2 centimeters and it is again very close to the apical pleura. It is very close to the apical pleura, not in the other regions close to the pleura. And the lesion is quite uh, well circumscribed. It is uh, gray white or slightly yellowish in color and that is because of the uh, necrotic areas. And in histology, as we have already discussed in primary tuberculosis, these patients show the classic diagnostic finding, which is the granuloma. And if you recollect, a granuloma is also what is known as a tubercle also. And a granuloma contains, if you remember from what we did earlier, it contains the special cells, which are known as the epithelioid histiocytes the giant cells, the lymphocytes, the plasma cells and the central caseous necrosis. So, that is the hallmark of the histologic finding. Now, let us look at some of the features of secondary tuberculosis. So, as we have learnt earlier, these are patients who have pre-existing hypersensitivity response already elicited by them 
the bacillus by itself elicits a very strong tissue response, uh, which is in the form of fibrosis and it tries to wall off this infection. And hence, the regional lymph node involvement in these patients is very, very low. But what happens in these patients is an extensive cavitatory destruction of the lung parenchyma and from where these uh, caseous material can be brought out in the sputum. And it is the sputum that we can test for the presence of the AFP bacillus. How does this uh, disease progress? Progression is seen more commonly in the elderly and in the immunocompromised. And as I said earlier, uh, one of the ways is extension of the local lesion with caseation. And from there, the lesion can extend into the bronchus when the patient brings out all the caseous material in their sputum, they cough it out. The other method of progression is erosion into blood vessels and this is the reason as the vessel is getting eroded, the patient brings out blood in their sputum, which is also known as hemoptysis. Now, if a patient has been treated adequately, so if he has received adequate treatment and completes his treatment, the entire lesion will heal by fibrosis. So, if you treat a patient adequately, the lesion completely heals by fibrosis. However, if the patient does not take complete treatment, in that case or in a patient who has a very impaired response, let us say is immunosuppressed, in that case the disease can spread. So, we have seen in primary tuberculosis when the disease spreads, it can go to the meninges, it can go into different organs which is known as miliary tuberculosis. So, miliary tuberculosis can be a complication both of primary tuberculosis or of secondary tuberculosis. So, now let us see that how does the disease progress when it goes into the miliary form of tuberculosis. So, interestingly this organism as it drains through the lymphatics, it goes into the lymphatic ducts and we all know that the lymphatic ducts, they go into the venous return of the body and from the venous return of a body, it will go to the right side of the heart. From the right side of the heart, it goes to the pulmonary arteries and once it reaches the pulmonary arteries, it is very easy for the blood to go into the systemic circulation which means that the bacilli also disseminates into the systemic circulation and it will seed into many different organs. So, what started as a small lesion in the lung, drained through the lymphatics, comes back through the venous return and then via the pulmonary artery, it is disseminated everywhere into the body. So, that is how miliary tuberculosis develops. So, if you look at patients having miliary tuberculosis, they have lesions in many organs of the body. So, they have many systemic lesions and if you look at the list, it is a huge list, it can go into different organs. If you look at the lung, from the lung, it goes to the liver, to the bone marrow, to the adrenals, to the spleens, to the meninges, it can go to the kidneys. It can involve the epididymis. In females, it can involve the fallopian tubes. So, if you look, the list is long. Many, many different organs can be involved in miliary tuberculosis. So, it is not just the lung in miliary tuberculosis. It involves many, many different organs within our body. So, how does microscopy or gross of these patients look? Now, if you look at primary and secondary tuberculosis, we spoke of single lesions in the lung. In primary tuberculosis, it was a subpleural lesion, which was in the upper part of the lower lobe or lower part of the upper lobe. In secondary tuberculosis, we spoke of apical lesions. However, in miliary tuberculosis, the patient will have multiple microscopic small lesions. It is not one lesion, it is a multiple microscopic dot like lesions throughout the 
lung or in the organ which has been involved. Okay. So, the word miliary comes from the word millets. So, if you have all seen millets, it is quite commonly available in the market. They are very tiny 2 to 3 millimeter small uh, grain like uh, uh, seeds that are available in the market. So, these lesions resemble the millets and that is why the name miliary tuberculosis was given to these patients. Now, how do these lesions progress? So, if a patient has miliary uh, tuberculosis, he is likely to develop pleural effusion. So, fluid develops in their pleural cavities or they can develop con into a tuberculous empyema or the entire pleura can undergo fibrosis and then the patient develops obliterative fibrosis pleuritic lesions. Okay. Obliterative fibrotic pleural lesions. Now, from the lung patients can also develop endobronchial or endotracheal or laryngeal tuberculosis, though this kind of a lesion is much rarer. It is more common for the lesion to spread into the pleura than to spread into the endobronchial or endotracheal regions. So, to summarize, today we have discussed about what causes tuberculosis and we looked at the clinical features of tuberculosis. So, most patients will present with fever and the important thing to remember is the fever is very low grade. It is not high grade, it is a low grade fever with the evening rise of temperature. Patients can have enlarged lymph nodes, patients can come with cough with hemoptysis. We looked at the three different forms of the disease. So, which is the primary tuberculosis, we looked at the secondary tuberculosis and the miliary tuberculosis. So, in both primary and secondary tuberculosis, the lesions are restricted to the lung and there may be lymph node, hilar lymph node involvement. In primary, the lesion is subpleural, while in secondary, the lesions are mainly apical. While if you look at miliary tuberculosis, it is as a result of complication, dissemination from either a primary tuberculosis or a secondary tuberculosis. So, these patients can develop miliary tuberculosis as a complication, where the bacilli seeds itself in multiple different organs. The other important thing we learned today is the hallmark histology of tuberculosis, which is a granuloma and the granuloma contains many special cells. To name some of them, you have epithelioid histiocytes, you have the Langhans giant cells, you have lymphocytes, plasma cells and the classic caseous necrosis, which is diagnostic of tuberculosis. So, we stop with this today. Thank you.